Hi, I'm Dan Resnicek, a urologist in Bellingham, Washington with Pacific Northwest Urology. And today I'm gonna to talk about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. A few weeks ago, I did a video on overview of bladder cancer and went over the diagnosis and treatment options of all bladder cancer. But as I discussed in that video, the treatments for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer can be somewhat intricate and there's a lot of different options. Um, and this video is specifically gonna go over those treatments today. If you have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, you've already been seen by a urologist and already had a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor to get a diagnosis. A pathologist has looked at the tumor on the microscope and has diagnosed you with cancer. You should have also already had imaging of the abdomen that looks at the kidneys, ureters, and bladder to ensure that tumors have not come from other areas within the collecting system and the ureters or of the kidney and not in the lymph nodes or other organs of the body. Overall, three quarters of patients are diagnosed with bladder cancer in the non-muscle invasive stage. As far as the TNM classification of staging, this includes stages TA, T1, and TIS. Also, the N and M stages are zero, so the cancer is only in the lining of the bladder or just under the lining of the bladder. T2 or higher involves the muscle or surrounding tissues of the bladder and nodal or metastatic involvement suggests that the cancer has gone elsewhere. So for non-muscle invasive disease, TA, T1, or TCIS. Overall, the survival for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is favorable. And we have treatment options that help reduce the progression or worsening of the cancer, as well as reduce the recurrence rates, how often the cancer comes back. Although overall survival rate is very favorable with bladder cancer, it can still be a very frustrating disease to have and to treat as a physician. Bladder cancer has a very high recurrence rate when we compare it to other types of cancers. Why is that? Well, the reason is something called a field effect. Bladder cancer, unlike something like colon cancer, um, happens in a very different mechanism. Things like colon cancer that we've studied typically start with a single cell. That cell then proliferates, and if it spreads to other areas, those other cancers throughout the body or other areas in the colon are clones or exact genetic replicates or offspring of that first tumor. Bladder cancer is different. Uh, field effect cancers like bladder cancer happen because your bladder is exposed to things called carcinogens or cancer-causing toxins that your body has um, been exposed to over a period of many years. This leads to DNA damage throughout the bladder. Oftentimes, bladder cancer can be found with multiple tumors at the same time. And these tumors, unlike the colon cancer tumors, are completely genetically different. They may have completely different um, DNA errors within them. This also leads to a higher recurrence rate because other cells within the bladder already have some DNA damage and are more likely to develop cancer in the future. This is especially important to reduce the risk of additional carcinogens. So if you are a smoker, stop smoking. That may reduce your risk of getting further bladder cancers down the road. The estimates for the recurrence and progression of bladder cancer vary significantly depending on what study you look at and what patients you look at and what risks patients are for recurrence. Overall estimates range from 40 to 80% chance of cancer recurrence within five years, and about a 10 to 20% chance of progression to muscle invasive disease through follow-up. Certainly some non-muscle invasive bladder cancers are more aggressive than others. When we look at patient, back at patients with this disease over a period of time, certain factors make some patients much more susceptible to recurrence and progression than others. Based on this data, we then assigned risk factors to determine which patients are most likely to recur and most likely to progress and change our surveillance and treatment options to tailor to those patients. So how much of a difference are we talking about here? Well, the American Neurological Association and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network have both assigned non-muscle invasive bladder cancer patients 
into three basic risk groups. There's a low risk group, an intermediate risk group, and a high risk group. Among those risk groups, only 1% of patients in the low risk group progressed to muscle invasive disease, whereas up to 15% of patients in the high risk group progress in some studies. So there's a big difference between these numbers, and that's why our differences in follow-up and treatment recommendations vary. So what factors go into these risk groups? Well, it's important to understand what goes into the pathological um, rating system before we talk about the risk groups. Staging and grading are very important here, and for more detailed information, go to my overview video on bladder cancer. Briefly, grading is how aggressive the cancer looks on the microscope to a pathologist. Some people describe this as either fast-growing or slow-growing cells. Historically speaking, there were three um, different grades, grade one, two, and three for bladder cancer. Um, but several years ago, pathologists have changed that to being either low grade or high grade, and it's a more simple system. Grade determines how fast the cancer cells are growing and how likely they are to progress. Staging refers to how far the cancer has grown into the body, as we discussed before. So TA stage is cancer only in the lining of the bladder or the urothelium. T1 disease is into the connective tissue right below the urothelium. And carcinoma in situ is a specific type of high-grade cells that are growing in the lining of the urothelium alone. Together, these are the different stages that comprise non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Again, as we discussed before, T2 or higher involves a cancer that has grown through and into the muscle of the bladder. So now that we understand staging and grading, we can talk more about risk groups. So let's first go over the low risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer group. So low risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer comprises the least aggressive cancer cells in bladder cancer. These are all low grade, so non-aggressive, slow growing tumors that are only in the lining of the bladder or TA. These are also smaller tumors, tumors three centimeters in size or less, and also solitary tumors. So in order to be a low risk bladder cancer, you must have non-aggressive cells, one tumor in the bladder, and smaller than three centimeters in size. Next, moving on, we'll talk about intermediate risk bladder cancer. Now, there's a lot of different ways a patient can have intermediate risk bladder cancer. They can have a low risk bladder cancer that's recurred within one year. They can have a low grade tumor that's larger than three centimeters in size or multiple low grade tumors within the bladder. Also, they can have a high grade tumor less than three centimeters in size. Last, you can have a low-grade tumor that goes just beyond the urothelium into the connecting tissue, or low-grade T1 disease. There are multiple ways that a patient can get high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. First, if the patient has high-grade T1 disease or any high-grade tumor that's invading underneath the urothelial layer into the lamina propria. Second, if a patient had high-grade TA disease and has a recurrence of the same, if a patient has a tumor greater than three centimeters or multiple high-grade tumors at diagnosis, if a patient has presence of carcinoma in situ at any point in time, that automatically diagnoses them with high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. If the patient has intermediate risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and has a recurrence after BCG therapy, or last, there are multiple types of variant histologies which are rare but associated with much higher risk, including micropapillary, sarcomatoid, neuroendocrine, squamous differentiation, or lymphovascular invasion. Presence of any of these automatically qualifies having high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer. And last, not on this list, but prostatic urethral involvement in a male also qualifies as high risk. Okay, so that's a lot of different options out there, and there's a lot to cover, and it can be confusing but you should be working with a urologist that should be able to explain these to you in further detail to better tell you what risk group or what category you're in.
Also, if you have a question, it's always um, good to get your pathology report and to compare that to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, which are available for patients online. So next, let's go over treatment options. So we'll first start with low-risk treatment. So patients with low-risk disease, as I mentioned before, are typically treated with the transurethral resection or removal of that bladder tumor using a camera at the time of diagnosis. Oftentimes, they can be offered intravesical chemotherapy immediately following surgery to prevent the risk of recurrence, but generally no further treatment is necessary. Because recurrence rates are much lower than high-grade disease, our surveillance or follow-up strategy is also less intense. Patients with low-risk disease are generally recommended a cystoscopy three to four months after the original diagnosis and removal of the tumor. If that one is normal, generally following up six to nine months after that, and then yearly for up to five years. Because the risk of tumors in the upper urinary tract or the ureters up into the renal pelvis is quite low, Upper tract imaging is generally not recommended for low-risk disease unless some other factors are present. So next, let's talk about intermediate and high-risk patients. And it's important to note for these patients, we have different treatment options as well as different surveillance. So these are two different parts of the therapy and follow-up that are required for patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Treatments that are performed for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer are designed to reduce recurrence rates and reduce progression. And we have to weigh the benefits of doing that with the risks of the treatment themselves. And that's why the therapies and the treatment algorithms differ for intermediate and high-risk disease. Treatment options for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer for intermediate or high-risk patients involve either intravesical chemotherapy or intravesical immunotherapy options, and in some patients with very high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, cystectomy or surgical removal of the bladder. Intravesical chemotherapy options are given in an outpatient setting, typically with a catheter. A cytotoxic or cancer-killing agent is given into the bladder via a catheter, and the patient then holds that in their bladder for the next hour or two and urinates following that period. The benefit of this intravesical treatment is that these potent chemotherapy agents can be given into the bladder alone. And because the bladder has a very strong membrane that prevents absorption of these chemicals into the rest of the body, it can reduce the systemic side effects that are typically associated with chemotherapy agents. So these patients typically don't get the nausea, hair loss, and many of the other side effects of chemotherapy. Patients can experience local effects within the bladder including frequency, urgency, burning with urination. Chemotherapy agents given this way include doxorubicin, epirubicin, mitomycin C, and gemcitabine. They are typically given in the bladder once weekly over a six-week period. Immunotherapy for bladder cancer typically refused, refers to BCG treatments. BCG stands for Bacillus calmet guarin. BCG is a live, attenuated, bacteria given into the bladder. It was originally designed as a vaccine for tuberculosis throughout the world. It is still used in areas of high prevalence of tuberculosis. In terms of, in terms of its use for cancer, BCG is an incredibly effective immunotherapy agent and has been the mainstay of treatment for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer since 1977. The exact mechanism of BCG treatments to the bladder is not understood. However, it recruits certain immune cells to the bladder that are useful for fighting cancer cells in addition to fighting this typical type of strain of bacteria. Once the bacteria is put into the bladder, the immune system response increases. And as we give the BCG treatments over a period of six weeks, these immune cells fill up the bladder and help fight cancer. BCG treatment reduces both cancer progression and cancer recurrence. BCG is given into the bladder by placing it into a liquid, placing a small catheter into the bladder and instilling the liquid into the bladder. The catheter is then removed and the patient holds their urine for a period of several hours to keep the bacteria in the bladder to initiate the immune response. 
Next, the patient voids in the toilet and bleaches the toilet. So the two main treatments for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer involve intravesical chemotherapy or intravesical immunotherapy with BCG treatments. So now let's talk about what treatment strategies and what treatment algorithms are used for both intermediate and high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. First, let's talk about intermediate risk. Patients with intermediate risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer have higher rates of recurrence compared to low-risk bladder cancer, but still have low rates of progression to muscle invasive disease compared to high-risk patients. Thus, the treatments that we design for intermediate risk bladder cancer are primarily done to reduce the recurrence rate of the disease and the need for other surgeries, such as a transurethral resection of a bladder tumor. Trials have shown a range of effectiveness with treatments in reducing recurrence when looking at BCG, epirubicin, and mitomycin C. Overall risk of recurrences can be reduced by 20 to 50%, depending on which study we're looking at and which treatment option. The most common option given for intermediate risk bladder cancer is BCG treatment. This is typically given in a six week induction course where the patient comes in and once a week for a six week period gets intravesical BCG. If the patient responds to that agent and does not have a recurrence, the BCG may be offered as maintenance treatments at three months, six months, and 12 months for a three-week cycle each time. Maintenance BCG for one year after intermediate risk bladder cancer treatment has been shown to reduce the risk of recurrence compared to no maintenance treatment. No further BCG is recommended beyond year, year one as there have been several clinical trials that have shown no benefit for one year compared to three years of maintenance BCG therapy in intermediate risk bladder cancer patients. Alternatives to BCG therapy include induction chemotherapy, which is given very similarly to BCG. A six-week induction course of BCG is typically recommended for intermediate risk bladder cancer patients who can't get BCG or prefer chemotherapy as an alternative. Chemotherapy generally has a slightly lower effectiveness in forms of recurrence and progression when comparing to BCG treatments. Some patients, such as those who are immunosuppressed or patients on chronic steroids, may not benefit from BCG and thus may be better candidates for intravesical chemotherapy. Because the risk of recurrence is higher compared to low-risk patients, our surveillance is more often than in low-risk patients. Surveillance for intermediate risk bladder cancer includes a cystoscopy and cytology, which is urine cells looked at the microscope by a pathologist, first beginning at three months after resection of your first tumor. Then the recommendation is to continue cytology and cystoscopy every three to six months for the first two years, and then annually thereafter for the rest of the patient's life. In addition to cytology and cystoscopy, a patient is also can consider doing upper tract imaging to look at the ureters or the renal pelvis every one to two years because the risk of recurrence in the upper urinary tract is small but present. So to summarize, intermediate risk bladder cancer patients have a higher rate of recurrence compared to low risk bladder ca cancer patients and are typically recommended a course of induction chemotherapy or BCG treatment to prevent recurrence. In addition, surveillance is more often than low-risk bladder cancer patients with both cystoscopy, cytology, and sometimes upper tract imaging recommended. Next, let's move on to discussing high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer treatments. These patients diagnosed at this stage and grade have been caught early, but have a very high chance of progressing to worse cancer that may require surgical removal of the bladder down the road. Treatments for these patients are primarily designed to reduce the recurrence rate and more importantly, reduce the progression to more advanced disease. Patients in this high risk group have features that have very high rate, have been shown to have very high rates of recurrence and progression, including having presence of carcinoma in situ, having variant pathology, lymphovascular invasion, or involving the prostatic urethra 
in men. Because of the much higher risk of progression of tumors in this high-risk disease, we have a more aggressive surveillance protocol to ensure that the cancer isn't worsening while we're not watching. Some patients with very high risk factors, such as pathological variants with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, with sarcomatous micropapillary, neuroendocrine, squamous, or glandular differentiation, may be recommended to actually undergo a cystectomy rather than other treatment options because they have a very high risk of progression to muscle invasive disease without treatment. If you have any of these features, you may want to talk to a urologist that specializes in bladder cancer treatments or get a second opinion, as these can be very aggressive and you don't want to be missed. Another important point to talk about for patients diagnosed with high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is often a urologist will recommend a repeat resection of the bladder tumor after the first one. The reason for this is twofold. First, patients that have high-risk disease have a much higher chance of having tumor at the edges of the resection or deep to the resection at the site that was previously removed. Waiting three additional months to take a look in the bladder may allow that cancer to progress in the meantime. In addition, on a second look resection, up to 30% of some patients may actually have presence of muscle invasive disease on a repeat resection, and getting a second pathological look at that tumor may be beneficial. Because of the risk of recurrence and progression for patients with high risk disease is high, we highly recommend treatment with either intravesical chemotherapy or BCG for patients with this type of cancer. BCG has been shown to be more effective than intravesical chemotherapy, especially for high-risk patients in preventing recurrence and progression. And when we talk about BCG, we again give it in a six-week induction period. And if that was effective and the cancer has not returned, we then continue maintenance BCG for a period of time afterwards. The Southwestern Oncology Group demonstrated a protocol that showed reduced risk of cancer progression with maintenance BCG therapy continued out to three years. Maintenance BCG is given in three week or once, maintenance BCG is given once weekly for a three week period at months three, six, 12, 24, 30, and 36. When comparing induction BCG to maintenance BCG, this study showed a reduction in recurrence from 60% to 40%, so a 20% improvement in the recurrence rate. In patients who cannot tolerate BCG or patients who are poor candidates for BCG, intravesical chemotherapy is again recommended. This again is given over a six-week induction period. Trials are still going on to demonstrate if maintenance therapy is effective for chemotherapy, but at this time it is not recommended. As far as surveillance goes for high-risk disease, surveillance protocols are more frequent as we discussed previously. Cystoscopies are recommended every three to four months for a period of two years, and then every six months for years three and four, and then annually thereafter. Imaging of the upper urinary tract is recommended at one to two year intervals to again, find cancer that may be developing in the ureter or renal pelvis. So that's a basic overview of treatment options for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer after diagnosis. This again is assuming that the cancer does not recur. If the cancer does recur, that does change the algorithm somewhat. And again, that gets even more complicated. And that's a time where you should probably be discussing with the urologist your options as there can be any number of possibilities. If the cancer recurs, your urologist may talk to you about another induction course of BCG, trying a different intravesical chemotherapy agent. Alternatively, your urologist may talk about a new chemotherapy checkpoint inhibitor known as pembrolizumab. If your risk of progression to muscle invasive disease is quite high, your urologist may also recommend a cystectomy for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Hopefully this was a helpful overview of the treatment options and surveillance required for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. There are a lot, there's a lot to unpack here and you should talk with your urologist further about any questions.
Be sure also to check out the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network website at nccn.org and the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network website, bcan.org, as they have a lot of great patient resources available. Furthermore, it's important to note that this video was done in 2020, and the data for this is based on current guidelines. This information is constantly changing, and as the years progress, you may want to visit these websites as updated information may be more present and more helpful. The last point I want to add is bladder cancer management is complicated. You should definitely be seeing a urologist that has managed bladder cancer on a frequent basis or consider a second opinion by another urologist. Also, it's important to look into clinical trials for cancer treatments, and you can always go to clinicaltrials.gov to see what clinical trials may be available for you for your cancer treatment in your area. Thanks for watching our video today. Again, Dan Resnicek with Pacific Northwest Urology talking about the treatment and surveillance for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer.